So, um, Barklord made a recent video to me. It's kind of wanting a little update on uh, where I stood and some of the things I said in this video back in 2010. Uh, it, it was called Post Civilization. And look, going back and looking at that video, I kind of I still agree with a lot of what I said back then, um, except for the parts involving the state. But um, but but I thought I'd just use this video to get to give kind of an ideological update. Uh, Mark Lord asks uh, if I identify as a Christian anarchist, and um, it really kind of depends. Um, I do think that you can read into the gospel a kind of anarchist message in the way that Jesus challenged the empire, you know, not through violence, but in a way, in a sort of nonviolent uh, refusal to recognize its legitimacy, which yeah, is very, which is why it kind of inspired. Tolstoy and Gandhi and Martin Luther King and, and so on. Um, but uh, what I don't do is I, I don't base my anarchism on the gospel, which is kind of how Christian anarchism tends to get defined. So in that sense, I'm not sure that the term would really apply to me. Um, now, I, I talked about you know global networks of uh, economic integration that have uh, developed under capitalism, and I asked, but asked if there's, um, you know, if, if it's worth the cost because it, we've produced so many have-nots compared to the haves, and how poverty is actually worse under industrialization. Um, and you know, I, I would agree that yes, poverty is worse under industrialization than under an agrarian or hunter-gatherer uh, society. And I think, uh, but I'd say that the causes are not industrialization per se, but rather um, capitalism. And it, it, there, it's actually kind of hard to differentiate the two. I mean, the two basically grew up together, and I think that industrial technology is largely the sort of material reflection of capitalism. And so uh, as we go into a post-industrial economy, is also, or as, we, as, as we go to a post-capitalist economy, we'll also need to go into a post-industrial economy. So, um, because I think that I don't think that technology itself is the problem, but I think the technology tends to reflect the society that creates it. And uh, a lot of the technology we have right now uh, reflects a society based on capital accumulation and consumerism and, you know, what, what Marx called commodity fetishism. Um, and uh, it serves the needs of, of a industrial capitalist society and, and I think that as we move towards an anarchist society we'll have technology reflect that. Uh, you know, I remember uh, Carl Hess once talked about how um, nuclear power is a, uh, an authoritarian technology while solar power is a democratic technology and I, I think that's kind of a good example of what we're getting at is, is that uh, as, as we create a society that is uh, non-hierarchical and decentralized. Uh, we'll also want to see technology that is also non-hierarchical and decentralized. Uh, and uh, also, you know, using existing technology in a more non-hierarchical and uh, decentralized manner. So, you know, I, th I think that technology has a interesting way of mirroring society. Of course, it, it's a two-way street. It's, it both mirrors society and, and shapes society. So it's it's a complex phone, and actually, actually took a college course on society and technology, and it, and there's, it's a vastly complex issue. But uh, I, I do think that technology isn't the problem in itself, but it's a reflection of the society that creates it. Um, and, and as far as globalization, you know, I, I think that's a good thing that uh, the so-called anti-globalization movement has been rebranding itself as the uh, ultra globalization movement because uh, you know globalization doesn't have to be a bad thing what we have right now is capitalist globalization which involves the you know tearing down of uh, of national sovereignty in in order to promote the free movement of capital and what we should have instead is proletarian globalization where worker-owned firms trade with each other in other parts of the world and have this vast decentralized global trade network uh, where, where they trade goods and services, which is what we actually want to be crossing borders, rather than having capital cross borders uh, in order to ship jobs overseas. So, um, 
this kind of where I stand on globalization. Um, you mentioned a little bit about, about my thoughts on money. I thought I'd just, I know you didn't really ask a question about that so much, but I, I wanted to kind of expand on uh, where I've been coming from lately in terms of my, my views on money. Um, you know, the idea of mutual credit, I, I'd heard of it before, but uh, the, uh, the way it really started clicking for me was uh, when I, I, I was reading uh, this economic theory called Modern Monetary Theory, uh, where they talk about vertical versus horizontal money. Vertical money being state money that is uh, you know, printed and uh, spent into existence by the government uh, versus horizontal money, which is you know bank credit, which uh, all sums up to zero and is sort of used to leverage one's position. And so that dovetailed with uh, this book I read by David Graeber, who's an anarchist. Uh, it's called Debt the, Five, the First 5,000 Years. And um, in that book, he, he talks about how uh, like how these primitive gift economies are actually uh, you know kind of credit economy. And this is confirmed when I later read Marcel Mauss, who has an influence on Graeber. Um, and he talked about you know different times in history when we had pure credit economies and how these were actually better for the average person. So it 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 occurred to me then how a uh, a credit system without interest and you know, run by and for the people would actually help um, would actually serve as a system of mutual aid. Uh, and, and you know of course uh, there are anarcho communists like Kropotkin who you know, advocate that we should have mutual aid without any kind of accounting system, any kind of um, uh, you know, any, any kind of currency or credit. Um, and I think this works on a, uh, a small scale, which is exactly the scale that Kropotkin had in mind, so he wasn't naive about this. But yeah, I, I think that we should have, um, yeah, I, I like the idea of having these global trade networks. So that's why I do believe that, uh, uh, that having some sort of accounting system uh, like, like mutual credit would, it, would help in having the sort of price signals that would efficiently allocate goods and services to where they're needed. And uh, of course, there might be other ways of doing that. I've you know, heard the idea of peer-to-peer -peer networks as an example, and I don't really know enough about how those work to uh, really comment much further on them. But yeah, there could be other um, signaling systems that would allow for that kind of complex network of, of uh, mutual aid to, to come about. Um, my, I was thinking recently about property, and uh, it, it's interesting to me that you know all our right libertarians tend to equate uh, statism with collectivism. And it occurred to me recently how you know with private property rights, the state actually kind of imposes a a sense of isolation upon us. That like, uh, it that our system of private property basically makes us afraid of each other. And turn to the state for protection, whereas you know without it, we uh, we would actually turn to each other for protection and uh, turn towards more collective forms of living. So we'd be living together, and you know we we would know our neighbors and turn to them for help. And, and so that's why I th I think that um, an anarchist society would have these more collective forms of living that would uh, largely eliminate the need for these uh, sort of Georgia solutions that I had previously been advocating. Uh, I guess one thing I want to, final thing I want to comment on is uh, Mark Lord was asking if, if I think that um, that we can change the system in the, in the near term or if we'll have to wait for like a total collapse. And I don't know what, um, what you quite mean by total collapse. I mean, the total collapse for me would, would be you know, ecological collapse, which would depopulate the world massively and I hope we don't reach that point. Um, we, we are in the midst of an economic collapse and I think capitalism itself you know, might be in its death throes. Uh, but in, in any case what, what I think we need to start doing is uh, start building the new institutions right now that are going to serve us in the world to come. You know, um, uh, the, the idea is you know, something that the Wobblies have advocated called you know uh, building a new world in the shell of the old. It's called dual power. Um, 
Because, I mean, we're already in a disaster, but we can brave that disaster more easily if we uh, create new institutions right, uh, right now that, that will help serve us in the future. Um, and yeah, as that new world is created, as we see this uprising, uh, there's going to be a lot of conflict with the authorities. And, you know, in, in the Occupy movement, I've I've seen these militarized police forces in the right gear. I've been pushed with their batons. I've seen people beaten. I mean, it, it's it's a war zone out there. And I, you know, as this movement grows, it's going to get worse. Uh, but, you know, I think I think that revolution can, it's almost like a force of nature. You know, it, it sort of, it starts off slowly at first, you know, kind of like a hurricane. It just starts off uh, you know, bit by bit and sort of coalesces into this force that can't be stopped. And, and as the state authorities try to push back on it, it just only grows larger. And I think what you'll see with um, increasing state repression is uh, increasing radicalization of, of the movement. Uh, yeah, I mean, I know I was somewhat of a liberal at the time that I that the Occupy movement started and became and became radicalized largely because of it. Um, and uh, and, and I uh, still the Occupy movement is sort of there still has the liberals and the radicals as the two main factions, and I expect that as uh, as it goes on, people will become more and more radicalized, and and that, and, and we'll see the revolution carried through. At least that, that's my hope, uh, because I think that the, the alternative to revolution is, you know, not not a pretty sight. I think revolution is our best hope, and it, and it it seems like that is where the tides are are turning. And the state can try and repress it if they want. It will only grow larger, and uh, I think capitalism stays our number. So uh, anyway, I hope that uh, that answers your questions and. Matt has probably answered more than you asked, but I um, uh, hope, uh, hope that works for now. Peace.